Good night, everyone. I hope all of us had a wonderful day. And we are here tonight where we can just sing and magnify God's holy name. Tonight is our evangelistic night, it's our Sunday night service. Before we go into song service, let's bow our heads as we pray. Loving God and most loving Father, we thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy. We thank you for bringing us all here safely tonight where we can continue to worship and magnify your high and holy name. I prefer even those who are on the way that may hasten their footstep that they too may come in and join us and to worship you in spirit and in truth is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn is number 334, 334. Come now, fount of every blessing, through my heart to sing thy grace. In number 334. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness prove, while a hope of endless glory. Is my heart with joy and love. Ere I raise my Ebenezer, neither by thy help have come. And I hope by good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. Me to rescue me from danger, interpose his precious blood. Oh, to bring a bitter death, daily and constraint to be. Let I go, like a better, by me closer still to thee. Born to wonder, Lord, I feel. Amen. Our next hymn is number 338. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim to this barren land. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim to this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty, holy in thy form. Redeem how 
I love to proclaim it with thee by the blood of the Lamb redeemed. Who is it for thy mercy? Is silent forever, I love. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, how I love to proclaim it. Is silent forever, I love. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think. Love is the theme of my song. I am redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, I love to proclaim it this time forever. I am. I know I shall see in His beauty the King. I delight to love him, be guarded by footstep and give. Next, next thing is number 439. 439, how far from home? How far from home? I asked a son. I bent my step. The watchman speak along the night. It's almost gone. My morning soon will be. Then we go. But if I fly with no bright star, I guide in me till thou shalt reach the realms of light in everlasting day. I ask the war where on the field this was his soul, in twilight song with so die the battle is not long. Then we no more, but will endure the conflict till thy work is done. For this we know the prize is sure when victory is won. But sea and sun seems with one voice to make reply. Thy wasted sun and early run, eternity is thy. Then weep no more with one in tone, potential sign, a ticking rock. And waiting for to have a drop it's not far from home, not far from home. Oh, blessed God, the travelers do the hard to check with love for He in Bama's blood and join the mother's Then we go. Steps never roll, our trial has passed, our joys complete, safe in our father's soul. Amen. Our next hymn is number five to five. Oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I. 
My soul in its conflict and sorrow would fly. So sinful, so where would I die? Would I be the best rock of faith? Jesus, I'm hiding in thee. Hiding in thee. Hiding in thee. The best rock of faith. Jesus, I'm hiding in thee. In the calm of the noon, tide in sorrow, long all. In time when temptation goes home, he is poor. In the tempest of life, oh, it's what even seen. The best rock of faith, Jesus, I'm hiding in thee. Hiding in thee, hiding in thee. The best rock of faith, Jesus, I'm hiding in thee. How often the conflict when pressed by the foe I fled to my refuge and free on my road How often when trials I see heaven's road Have I hidden in thee, O oh, the rock of my soul Why did in thee? Let us stand as we continue the use of him. Number five, four, eight, seven. I come to the garden alone while the
Standing and bow heads as we pray. Loving God, the most gracious Father, we thank you for your grace, the love, and the mercy. We thank you that your grace are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Dear Father, we thank you where we just have the privilege tonight of where we can come into your house of worship. Dear Father, we thank you where we are still on the land of a living where our prayer can be offered and supplication can be made. Dear Father, we give you all the praise and the honor that you own unto our holy and matchless name. Because you are God and there is none like you. At this moment, I pray that you forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wash us thoroughly and make us white in the snow. Dear Father, I bring before you every member here who is present tonight, O oh God. So our faiths are different from our needs. So I pray at this moment that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. Dear Father, there may be those tonight who are present here who might be sick, O oh God. I pray that at this moment that you will send the healing balm from above. And heal them from every sin, sick disease, O oh Father. I pray this moment that you will touch them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet, so they can be recovered from their illness, O oh God. Dear Father, maybe those who are in financial need, O oh God. Dear Father, you promised us in the words that the cattle and a thousand hill belongs to you. And if you are hungry, you tell us the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Dear Father, I pray that they will continue to put their trust and their confidence in you and rest assured that you are going to come to them. You promise us that you will open doors that no man can shut, dear God. And dear Father, we just have to just continue to trust you where we cannot trace you. Dear Father, I bring before the man someone who's going to break the bread of life to us tonight, dear God. I pray that you may give him a message direct from your throne as the minister to us, that you may be a source of strength to all of us and a blessing. And I pray when you leave from this place tonight, that we will be blessed and we will join closer to you, is our prayer in Jesus' name. I just want to say welcome to everyone tonight. And I pray and hope that as we worship tonight, as, as we fellowship tonight, that God's blessing will truly be ours. I want to say welcome to one, welcome to all, and may God continue to be bless us. Our scripture reading comes to us from John chapter 4, John 4, 23. John chapter 4, and verse 23. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Okay, we'll sit as we use the hymn number 539. I will only seek the Savior. I will run of him each day. Welcoming you here this evening, this wonderful Sunday evening. Whether you've come from the east or the west, the north or the south, we've all gathered here together in Jesus' name. And usually on Sunday nights, we have our evangelistic meetings, but tonight we'll actually be delving a bit into the 10 days of prayer that have been happening conference-wide. I don't know how many of you have been uh, following it on Zoom. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, we have one lonely hand there. Okay, but tonight 
you're in luck because I'm going to do a bit of a recap of the last few days of prayer, and then I'm going to delve straight into the fifth day for that week of prayer, the 10 days of prayer. Uh, before we do, let us just bow our heads and close our eyes as I speak to God. Heavenly Father, Lord, tonight we thank you so much for the privilege and the blessing we have to come into your house. We thank you that we are your children, call out of darkness into this marvelous light. We thank you there, Father, for your love, mercy, and grace, but mostly we thank you, Father, for your word, your word which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And even as we speak of your word, even as we meditate upon what your Holy Spirit shows us there, Lord, let it not just be mere words on a page or things that we have in our minds, but let them be engraved upon our hearts, not on tables of stone, but tables of flesh. Let them have a living power to change us, and through us there, Lord, to change our world. So be with us, and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This year, our overriding topic for the 10 days of prayer is back to the altar. Back to the altar. It's a very interesting topic. Altars are not something that we usually see in our churches. I know when I was growing up, every church had a altar, physical altar, right in front of the pew. And usually after the message, people would be encouraged to come up and kneel at the altar for prayer, for salvation, for healing, for deliverance, for whatever. We often don't see that because the format of churches have changed. We sometimes speak of having a personal altar. But for many of us, the imagery that you have of an altar is uh, something, the pictures that you saw in the storybooks where you have this set up of stones, and usually there'll be some sort of sacrifice on it. Well, God is calling us back to altars. And uh, over the course of the last few days, it's spoken of several different instances where people have erected altars. It all started off on day one, where it says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. Many of us are familiar with the story of Abram. Abram, who was a faithful servant, even among a heathen land. And God called him out of his comfort zone, as it were, from a wrong family, from a wrong friends, from a wrong, the prosperous, easy life that awaited there in earth. And he said, go into the place that I will show you. And there will make of you a great nation. Sounds easy on the outset, but we're speaking of Abraham, who was an old man, already, already past the known age of childbearing, yet God is saying, out of you, I'm going to form a great nation. But Abraham went by faith, and in his going, God, you know, he, he blessed him as he went on. And Abraham had so many, so many things to thank God for where God took him among strangers and blessed him and prospered him. When famine and drought came, he took him into Egypt. And even though at one point, you know, it's like his family life was in danger, God worked a miracle to deliver him even from the envious eyes of the king of Egypt. And God reminded him of his promise time and time again. He took him out under the skies and he said, look on the stars. As far as you can see these stars in the heavens, so will your senior descendants be. As the sand of the sea are without number, so will your seed be. And Abraham, we are told, built an altar there in remembrance of the promises and the faithfulness of God. He wasn't the only one who was recorded for doing such things. His, his son, Isaac, also built an altar. One known time is when he was dwelling among some tribesmen and they dug a well. You know, when you're living out in desert places, water is very important for you, both for personal sustenance as well as for your sheep. And he was a great herdsman. And his servants dug a well and they found water. But then the neighboring tribes, they came by and they started fighting them for it. Now, you and I, we'd probably fight back. We took our time and effort, dug the well. It's our water. But Isaac and his servants, they moved on. They dug another well. They found water. Tribesmen came and fought them again. They moved on. They went further afield. They dug another well. 
Christ men came and fought them again. They moved on. They found another well. They dug it. Nobody fought them this time. And they had peace. And Isaac raised up an, uh, an altar there in that place because God had given him deliverance. Jacob, his son, went after he had from Esau and he was running for his life because he had tricked his brother. He's running away, leaving his family far behind, leaving everything that he's known and he's loved, heading into the great unknown. And he's remorseful and repentant because he did something, hoping to get God's blessing, but now it seems that the curse of God is resting heavy on his life. But God appeared to him. He got a dream, a vision in the night, where he saw the ladder stretch between heaven and earth and angels ascending and descending upon it. And it was revealed to him there in that dream that God was still with him. And he said, surely this is the house of the Lord. And he built an altar there at Bethel. For he said, here I have seen God. Gideon, when God approached him and told him that he would be the instrument of deliverance for his people Israel from among the people of the land. He was so overwhelmed at the sight that this angel came and spoke to him and chose him. A simple, humble man. And ordained him to be the man who would deliver his people that he built there an altar. What is the point of all these altars? They are signs and symbols of our testifying that God has done a great thing in our lives. That he has delivered. That he has healed. That he has restored. That he has heard in some way. When God has done something good for you, we're not just supposed to keep quiet about it. We're supposed to tell us about it. As these altars were physical manifestations that somebody said, God has done such and such for me. We may not actually wreck a pillar of stones, but we have a witness. We have our testimony. We have to tell somebody, somebody, and somebody what God has done for us in our lives. And so we're encouraged to raise up the altar. We learned about Where are you? Adam and Eve were created perfect, sinless, given a beautiful home, all of God's blessings. And God favored them. He met with them every day. In the cool of the day, we're told that he came down and spent time with them and communed with them. But somewhere along the way, they got sidetracked by Satan. They listened to his voice and they figured, God is holding something back from me. And they decided to listen to the deceiver. And the minute they partook of that temptation, the minute they ate the fruit and disobeyed God, they felt a separation. Who of us here haven't felt that separation that sin brings? Does it feel good? It doesn't. It feels empty, lonely, dark, separation. You're wretched. The thing that you thought would bring you joy only brings you pain. And they felt that. And when God came down looking for them, he couldn't find them. The place where they used to meet, that special secret place, they weren't there any longer. The voice that they used to come running to, they were now hiding from it. And they were no longer clothed with the glory of his righteousness. They were trying to cover themselves up with fig leaves. And so the Lord appeared and said unto Adam, and said unto him, Where? Art thou? Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. It wasn't that God didn't know where Adam was. He knew exactly where Adam was. He knew what he had done. But he was asking Adam, Adam, do you know where you are? Do you understand what has happened here? Do you see the depths of your separation from me? He was calling on him to consider where you are. Confess and repent so that you might be saved. We also need that in our lives. So many times during the day, daily, hourly, sometimes even more than that, we may allow things to come between us and God. Maybe it's that temper that gets the better of us. Or perhaps we have a weakness for gossip or for slander. Maybe we cherish covetousness in our lives or harbor ill will towards others. We may not express it verbally, but our actions show the thoughts of our hearts. And we're not just 
bringing harm to other people. We're creating separation between us and God. And God calls all of us. It says Charles, Roland, Alpha, Aldrin, where are you? Come to me. Let us reason together. We also learn further on, uh, on day three, about morning and evening. In First Chronicles chapter 23, verse 30, it spoke about, And to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord, and likewise at evening. These were instructions given to the Levites. These were the praise leaders in God's sanctuary. They were the ones who looked out for it. A mix between praise and worship leaders and deacons. They were there day and night. Their whole service was towards God. And God gave them special instructions. He said, in the morning and in the evening, come before me. Come with your praise. Come with your thanksgiving. Come, meet with me. This was an example set by God among the leaders of his church so that all Israel would now establish a pattern. In the morning when you rise, in the evening before you retire, Come and spend time with me. Come and meet with me. Confess your wrongs. Ask me for help and guidance. Ask me for strength. Ask me for wisdom. Know that you can't do this on your own. Know that your help and your sustenance comes from me. Come. Meet me in that secret place. God also wants us to do that with him. Sometimes we get so busy. I get busy. I get over busy. Too busy. Doing what? My own thing. Things with work. Things with the family. Sometimes even things for church. And sometimes I don't have that time I need for to spend with God. What about you? Have you gotten too busy to spend that time? When we wake up, what's the first thing that we do? Do we take time with God? And I don't just mean the automatic, you know, you sit down and you say, thank you, Lord, for waking me up. Help me to have a good day. Amen. And we rush off to do other things. But do we spend time maybe reading his word, meditating on what he has to say to us, sitting in silence and hearing what the Spirit is speaking to us for this day, getting strength for the conflict ahead? We don't know what we meet when we step out that door. Sometimes even before you step through the door, the devil's already snuck in the window and he's waiting for you. We need Jesus during our day and even when we go to sleep. While we're dead to the world, God is watching over us. On day four, we looked at what brings God back. It's taken from 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. This is a bit of a familiar story. It surrounds the showdown between the prophets of Baal and Elijah, the prophet of God, at Mount Carmel. Israel was in an interesting position. At Mount Carmel, where the showdown was, this was known to be a very fertile, forested place, green and lush. It was so rich and abundant that people saw it as a symbol of fertility and prosperity. But it had also become a place that was polluted by idol worship. You see, Israel had a king, but he wasn't a good king. He was a wicked king. He followed after all the gods of the Phoenicians and the Amorites and all those other dwellers of the land of Canaan. More so, he married the daughter of the Sidonian king, Jezebel. Now, women have a lot of influence over men. A man may be physically strong, but when it comes to a woman, he can be so weak. And Ahab was a weak king. Spiritually, ethically weak. And his wife could wrap him around his little, her little finger. And she led him into the worship and the service of the god Baal. And he in turn led all Israel, well almost 
all Israel into that worship. He got to the point where Elijah felt like he was all alone. There was nobody else serving God. But God called him for such a time as this. You see, sometimes even in the darkest moments of the church, even when it seems that from the pulpit to the pew, wickedness is reigning, when it feels like leaders aren't leading anymore, when it feels like God's word is no longer the standard, when it feels like, what's the point of me being here if we're no better than those out there? God still has men and women who will stand up and preach righteousness. And we can thank God for that. You see, Israel was going through a drought at this time. It was a physical drought. Three and a half years, no rain. All the trees were drooping. All the cattle were thirsty. Everywhere they were feeling the physical manifestation of God's blessing being withdrawn. But even more so, they were also feeling the spiritual vacuum of God's spirit not moving among them. And God through Elijah called them to prove who was God. Elijah said, choose. If Baal is God, choose him. If God is God, then choose him. What will you do? And the people answered him not a word. So he set up a contest. He said, let the, sir, let the priests of Baal set up their altar and offer sacrifice on it. And whosoever sends fire down from heaven, he is God. And the priests of Baal, they set up their altar and put their sacrifice on and they chanted from morning to evening. But Baal answered not a word because he was no God. Elijah got a little smart and snarky. He said, hey, maybe he's sleeping. Shout louder. Wake him up. Maybe he's hunting. He has no time. Cry louder. That drove them into a frenzy. They cried louder. They cut themselves. They tried to bring down fire, but they couldn't do it. Power was not there. Then Elijah, he set up. He, first he told Israel, draw near. And they drew near. And he took stones and he built up an altar. Dug the trench around it. Commanded them to fill it with water. Fill it again. Fill it again. He drenched the sacrifice, the altar, and all the ground around it, and it was wet. Then he prayed to the God of heaven. A simple prayer. And God heard. The fervent prayers of a righteous man availed much. God sent fire from heaven and consumed the earth, the sacrifice, the altar, and all that was on it. And all Israel said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Revival came because of the faithful example of one man standing up against the majority. God is also calling us to raise up an altar as a witness to all the world. What's that altar? Our lives are a testimony. The way we are, not just here. Here it's easy. We're surrounded by like-minded people. It's easy to be a Christian inside here. It's hard to be a Christian outside. When you're on the job and you're surrounded by pressure and temptation and outright evil. When you're at school and all the children are saying, hey, you're not cool. You don't do this. You don't dress like that. You don't drink this. You don't go there. You're a punk. It's harder. We've got to stand on something at that point. Where do we stand? Do we stand with God or do we stand with Baal? So we're encouraged to raise up that altar of witness, of testimony, of our allegiance to God. And leave an example so that others looking at us will see and may follow on. Before we move on to tonight's reading, I'm going to invite us to enter into a season of prayer, individual prayer. We'll have time for corporate prayer, but let this be a time where we can approach God for ourselves and speak to Him. Honestly, candidly, nobody needs to know what you're telling Him. Let's first take a few minutes and just... Confess to him anything that has been burning in your heart that you know is creating a, a, a distance between you and him. 
the weakness, the thing that's causing you pain and separation. Just talk to him for a few minutes. Confess to him and then thank him for delivering you from it. And then ask him for guidance with the challenges that you are facing, whatever they are. You know what they are. On the job, maybe it's financial, maybe it's health. Maybe you need assistance in making a difficult decision. Both ways seem good to you. You're not sure which way to go. But there is a way that seems right to a man. The end thereof leads to destruction. Ask God to give you wisdom on how you should choose. He says, I set before you life and death. Choose life. Ask him, show me, Lord, which way is life. So, I'm just going to invite us, let us stand, and we're going to sing one verse of sweet hour of prayer. But Alex, if you just raise up for me. One verse of sweet hour of prayer, and then we'll just take a few moments and have some individual prayer. Sweet of prayer, sweet. Let us just take a few moments. If you need to step aside, separate a little, go ahead and just speak to God and tell him what's on your heart. Amen. How do you feel? Much better. Much better. So, so far, we've covered that the altar represents repentance and confession of sins, a consecrated life and testimony, daily living in connection with God, and also revival and reform. For the fifth topic, we'll be looking at Jesus, the early riser. And under this caption, we'll learn how prayer equips us for service. Our scripture reading is John chapter 4, verse 23. And it says, But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. There is an altar truth in the life of Jesus that no Christian should miss. During the past few days, we have reflected much on altars in Scripture and the lives of those who built them. The altar is a metaphor or a picture word for a place and time of worship to the true and living God. And we don't need to possess a physical altar in order to worship God. In fact, if a follower of Jesus lives in consistent, earnest, Bible-bathed communion with God, 
he or she has already erected an altar as real as the one that Elijah built in 1 Kings chapter 18. We can see such an altar in the life of Jesus. Amid a busy life of daily ministry, constant threats and harassment, and withering assaults from the devil, Jesus made time for long seasons of prayer and worship. He who was equal with the Father, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6, still thought it important to be still and know that God is God. He submitted himself while here on earth and asked for his Father's guidance, asked for his help, asked for his protection. He submitted himself to his Heavenly Father. If Jesus is our example, should we do any less? We often like to be in the driver's seat, don't we? I don't need anybody's help. And then when we get in trouble, Lord, help me. Let's give him the wheel from the beginning. Jesus understood from an early age that his calling required constant connection with his father. You remember when he was 12 years old, he and his family, they went to Jerusalem for the Passover. And while he was there, he spent time in the temple speaking with the priests. And his mom and his dad, although they cared very much for him, they were a little on the careless side. When they left, they just assumed he was with somebody else. Somebody, family, friends heading back home. Sometimes we can make that same mistake with our own children. We can assume that because they're with other brethren that they're going to take them along. But as a young parent, I have to say that the job that God gave us, nobody else can take it. Others can help. They can be aunties and uncles, but he only gave us, he only gave them us as parents, and we have to help to raise them upright. But back to the story, I, I digress. Mary and Joseph, they lost track of Jesus. In fact, they lost much track of him that for more than a day, they didn't even know where he was. And then when evening time came, no doubt, supper time, they're like, where's Jesus? Susan, did you see Jesus? No, I, I thought he was with you. Joe, wasn't Jesus with you? No, I thought he was with John. John, have you seen Jesus? No, I haven't seen him since this morning. So they have to rush back to Jerusalem. Desperate now, like we have lost Jesus. You ever felt like you lost Jesus? Where did I put him? <laughs> they went back, and they searched high and low, looking for him. And they must have been frightened. After all, God gave them Jesus to take care of. The Son of God was entrusted to human hands and care, and we've lost him. Finally, they found him. Not at the playground, not at the wherever they were staying, but in the temple, in God's house. And his mother, understandably, was, or oh, she, she was flushed, and she was like, Son, don't you know we've been looking for you? You know what he said? Don't you know I must be about my father's business? I have to be honest. My sons, sometimes things come out of his mouth that I don't know whether to be vexed or amused. <laughs> Little children say the strangest things. But at 12 years old, Jesus recognized that he had a calling on his life. We sometimes think that children are too young to follow God. They're too young to get baptized. They're too young to make a commitment. In the Jewish culture, a boy was considered a man at 12 years old. He would go and he'd have to recite from memory verses from the Torah and be able to, you know, know certain things. And from then on, he was deemed to be responsible for his own spiritual salvation. At 12. At, at 12, we, we still cuddle our children. We, we still tell them, you can't do this, you can't do that. They're able to follow God if we teach them. If we train them. If we set a good example for them. They are fully capable of serving God. And Jesus knew that God's calling was on his life. 
The one who created the law had to learn the law in order to follow the law. Blows your mind, right? But there he was. And thanks to faithful teaching by his parents, he was now ready to embark on his mission at 12. But fast forward, now he's a man. He's formally being baptized and he's entered into mission. He understood that unless he's connected with his father on a daily basis, he could not carry the sins of the world. He could not remain true and faithful amid the onslaught of the enemy. That personal temptation when Satan came and told him, if you're the son of God, bow down to me and I'll give you everything. You don't have to go to the cross. I'll give it to you. Just one word. It's yours. And he could stand up to that and other temptations on the word of God and faith in his father. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, can you put it on the screen, please? We read that Jesus rose a long while before daylight and found a quiet, solitary place to talk and listen to his father. Let's read it together. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. This was a busy man. He long left the carpenter's shop behind. But he wasn't working for man. He was working for God. Daily his ministry was meeting men, women, boys and girls. People who were hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And sharing with them the truth found in God's word. And it wasn't because they weren't preachers. There were priests. There were scribes. There were Pharisees but they weren't teaching God's word. Jesus came to show us the Father and bring us back into the light. And people came to him, not just to hear the word, but it came also because he was healing and delivering people. He was freeing people from the shackles of sin, from demon possession, from sickness, from all sorts of things. And as his fame went out, people flocked to meet him. He couldn't get a rest. And so... The time when he was able to spend with God was early in the morning, before other people got up, before they started thronging the place where he was. It says that he got up a great while before the day and went into a solitary place. He didn't even take the disciples. He went by himself, him and God, and spent some personal time. I'm not too fond of waking up early. I've usually been a late riser. But I've learned that when you wake up in that early morning hour, there's a certain sweetness to the atmosphere. It's quiet. Your thoughts are clearer. When you open the word and you pray to God and you read it, there are no distractions. And it seems that God's voice can speak to you clearer. And you can talk to him Freely, because you're in your prayer closet. And when he speaks, you can hear, because there are no other distractions around. And Jesus did this. And as I said, I found from experience that when you do that, your day usually starts off so much better, because we've invited God into our hearts. The previous day for Jesus had been spent in full-on ministry, healing the sick, casting out demons, and redeeming the lost. When the disciples awoke, they noticed that Jesus was gone and went in search of him. And when they found him, Mark 1.37, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. Jesus' answer to them is a powerful reminder of the blessings that awaits all who tend their morning and evening altar. Look at Mark 1, 38. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For hereforth came I forth. Did you get that? 
it seems a little disconnected at first glance, but Jesus was already busy. He was already successful. People were already looking for him, seeking after him. He had a captive audience. He could have stayed there for another month. But now he's saying, I need to go somewhere else. Somebody else needs to hear. Somebody else needs to be healed. Somebody else needs to be delivered. I need to go. How did he come up with that? Did he just figure out, I'm bored of this town and I need to move on? Did he just think that someone over there might need to hear it? No, he was led. Because he'd been spending time with his father, the father led him wherever he went. Gave him the words to speak to whoever was listening. Showed him who needed healing, who needed deliverance, who needed forgiveness of sins. The Father guided him in all things. Few Christians today would give up a fertile ministry moment for an unknown one. Yet Jesus did exactly that with no hesitation because God had revealed the plans for that day to Jesus during his private devotional time. The Father affirmed Jesus' purpose as he prayed and waited in his presence. My friends, when we fail to seek God's presence in worship and prayer, we often miss God's plans for our day and his affirmation of our purpose. Today, tonight, let us pray for the commitment to rise early and spend time with God that he might be ready that he might ready us to fulfill his purpose for our day and our lives. And let us also commit that in the evenings when we return home, our days are different. We don't go to bed at 7 o'clock in the evenings, most of us. But still let us take time to thank God for his leading in our lives during the day, for his protection, for his goodness, for his movement on our lives and to touch others. And ask him to keep us through the night. Because there's no time of the day or night that we don't need him. Let's make this our renewed commitment. Seeking God. Personally. Let us pray. Heavenly Father. Thank you for your word and for your example through your son. Thank you for reminding us that as close as our experiences have been with you in times past, they're not sufficient to carry us forward into the next day. Remind us, dear Lord, that the source of our strength and our power is not in what we know, in our skills, in our eloquence, in our ability. It is in you. And dear Lord, even as the light bulb must be plugged into the socket to bring light, Lord, so we must be connected to you. You told us in your word that you are the vine and we are the branches. And if we are to have life, we must be connected to you. So help us to stay connected to you through prayer, through daily devotional worship, through spending time in your word, dear Lord, through meeting with the brethren in corporate worship and giving praise and testimony and witness to your holy name. And also hearing the word. Help us there, Father, not just to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. And let our light shine out. Help it to shine in our homes. Help our children to know that we are servants of the Most High. Help our husbands and our wives know that your spirit dwells within us. Let our neighbors know that this home is a consecrated place. Let those on the jobs know that we serve a great and a mighty God. Let the world know that we are walking in the light. Help us there, Father. Help us to raise up and to maintain the altars within our lives. And be a witness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, our Closing song tonight, number 290, 290, Turn Your Eyes 
upon Jesus. 290, let us stand together. Let us pray. Our kind and faithful and merciful Father, we thank you, dear God, for giving us the strength and the courage to be here tonight. We thank you for the words that the elder has delivered unto us, dear God. May we live here in peace. May we live here with a change of heart. May, li may we live here, dear God, knowing that you are God and you are merciful unto every one of us. And I pray that we continue serving you and we are continue telling others of your good works. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.